Hello, this is Lisa, CEO of site for y welcoming you to this week's Talking News on Friday the 15th of September 2023. This week on Wednesday, we held our open day and I am delighted to report that 70% of the people that came had not been engaged with the charity before. So they were new to us and we were able to give them lots of help and information of all the services that not only we offer, but many of the other island charities as well. It really was a lovely atmosphere this year and it is a formula I'm hoping to repeat next year when we have our next open day in September. Susan is busy, as always, planning all of the activities. We have wet wheels going out next Monday, although although all the places are now full. And the Warners holiday is now also full for October. However, coming up on the 20th of September, we have the White Sense feedback and chat meeting. So if you are a user of White Sense, please don't hesitate to come along to the meeting and give us your genuine feedback about how the service worked for you and any other comments that you have of how we can improve the service. So that's the 20th of September at Millbrook House. If you'd like to attend, it's always useful to know in advance so we can be ready. Please call the office on 5 2205. Finally, on September the 29th, we have a pudding and quiz night at Millbrook House. Again, this is a fun evening with, of course, pudding to eat at the end. If you again would like to attend, please do call the office. Lisa, CEO, Site for White, thank you. Here is this week's charity news. The trustees will be at the Isle of Wight Day at Braiding Roman Villa tomorrow, Saturday the 16th, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Please pop along and say hello. Swimming it at Medina Leisure Centre every Monday during term time is between 1.15 and 2.15 p.m. This group is open to everyone, and even if you just want gentle exercise in the water, we have the use of the whole pool, so there's plenty of room for all to enjoy. Our IT drop-in resumes at Millbrook House on Monday, 9.30 a.m. until 12.30 p.m. This is now an appointment-only service, so please call the office and book a slot with Sam. Yoga is on Tuesday between 1.45 and 2.45 at Millbrook House every week and the cost is £4. Coffee and Chat is on Wednesdays between 10am and 11.30am at Millbrook House. Please come along and meet the staff, volunteers and members for a chat and also to look at second-hand equipment, seek advice etc. This is open to everyone. The White Sense catch-up and feedback will follow the session so anyone with any comments or feedback please come along. Next Monday, the 25th of September, we have our fundraising meeting to discuss new ideas to raise vital funds. Everyone is welcome to come along at 10am, or if you are unable to make it but have ideas, please do not hesitate to share them with Susan, who will discuss at the meeting. On Friday the 29th, we have our Striders group. This walk... This group walk around various island locations and ending with lunch at a pub. This is a very sociable group and always welcomes new members to join. Members must be able to walk between three and seven miles. And if you're interested but require more details, please do not hesitate to call the office. On Friday the 29th, we have a pudding and quiz evening at Millbrook House starting at seven o'clock. We invite teams of four people to join in at the price of five pounds per person to include homemade pudding. This is a popular event and with a maximum of nine teams, please call the office to book a table ASAP. This is the last call for anyone wishing to come to Warner's Yarmouth between the 18th and 20th of October. We have three single rooms available for the cost of £140 to include breakfast, evening meal and entertainment. Please call the office by Wednesday the 20th to put your name down on the list. We are very pleased to announce we have been donated a beautiful hand-sewn quilt which we have decided to raffle. You can buy a square for £2 from the office. 
The draw will take place on December 13th. It is a king-size quilt. Further details on any of the activities and events can be obtained by calling the office on 52205. This article is read by Howard and is from the Island Echo concerning graffiti. A clean-up operation is to begin to rid graffiti from bus shelters, telecommunications cabinets and road signs between Newport and Wootton after a crew went on a spray paint frenzy earlier this week. The artwork, which appeared overnight on Tuesday into Wednesday, consists of a five-pointed star with the number four written inside it and in some instances 22 crew written next to it. It's been suggested that the four refers to the Southern Vectis bus route between Newport and East Cowes. The graffiti has appeared on dozens of pieces of street furniture on Wooden High Street, Racecourse and Fairley Road, including the Welcome to Newport signs. It's assumed that a group of feral youths are responsible for the criminal damage, with one island echo reader dubbing them low lives that are a waste of oxygen. In a joint statement, Island Roads and the Isle of Wight Council have said we're currently assessing the extent of the damage and the type of cleanup required for each site so we can remove the graffiti as quickly as possible. Southern Vectis has also commented on the situation with operations manager Simon Moy saying this act of vandalism is extremely disappointing for us and I'm sure for our customers. The graffiti has been reported to Island Roads, who are responsible for the bus stops on behalf of the Isle of Wight Council, and they'll take appropriate action. There's been a further antisocial behaviour in Newport overnight, with a flower bed decimated outside Boots in the High Street. Island Line and Hover Travel Team up to promote Car Free Travel Scheme. From Isle of Wight Radio, read by Joyce. Hover Travel and Island Line have teamed up to promote car-free travel from the Isle of Wight for residents and visitors who may be holidaying on the island and planning a day trip. Loretta Lale, Head of Commercial at Hover Travel, explains, As a foot passenger ferry, we are always encouraging our customers to park their cars and fly across the Solent with us and our customers are consistently asking us for the most convenient and cheapest options. Several island line stations have facilities which offer really great value for parking your car from as little as £2 per day. So we are looking to encourage our customers to park at their local rail station, hop on the train and then catch the hovercraft. Car parking at Shanklin, Sandown and Ride, St John's Road stations, costs just £2 per day, with the more limited spaces at Braiding Station offered for free. Customers then get to use more sustainable modes of transport for their trips to the mainland, complete with convenient connections and a quicker journey, with London just over two hours from Shanklin. Through ticketing, including your hovercraft flight and all train tickets, is bookable at both the rail stations and online, with discounts for all rail card holders. Plus, your rail ticket entitles you, entitles you to use the hover bus for free, connecting the hover port at South Sea to both train stations in Portsmouth. Mark Dunn, Island Line General Manager, said... We are very pleased to join Hover Travel for the Park Ride and Fly initiative, which highlights the great prices and parking available to Island Line customers. These, price, these prices are available now through station car park pay machines and via the Ringo app. As these are not promotional prices, regular customers can take advantage of even better value weekly car parking prices. And for our season ticket holders, car parking is included free of charge. Isle of Wight residents 
can also save on their hover travel flights with hover blue fares, which gives an ongoing discount of over 30% on day returns and over 10% on adult period returns. This is Michael reading an article from Ireland Echo. PCC Donna Jones pays tribute to police on National Emergency Services Day. Police and Crime Commissioner Donna Jones has publicly thanked the commitment of Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary and all those who protect and serve the public. The nation came together on Saturday, 9th of September, to show its support for all emergency services and NHS heroes on National Emergency Services Day. The Commissioner gave a speech during a service at the Civic Offices in Guildhall Square in Portsmouth, where the 999 flag was also raised and a two-minute silence was observed to remember all who have been killed as a result of their service to the country. The National Day of Support was founded in 2016 and today approximately 2 million people work and volunteer across the emergency services and the NHS. Other representatives from the emergency services as well as the Lord Mayor and Deputy Leader of the City Council were also at the event in Portsmouth. Hampshire and Isle of Wight Constabulary's workforce totals nearly 5,600, with 3,292 officers, as well as 2,111 police staff and 196 PCSOs. PC Donna Jones said, It was an honour to address everyone at the ceremony, because it is so important that we recognise the work of all those who are on the front line keeping people safe and saving lives. The 999 flag is a symbol of our gratitude, respect and unwavering support for the brave men and women who respond to our calls for help, irrespective of the challenges they face. Thank you for your dedication, your commitment and the personal sacrifices you make every day to help others. There are six main branches of the emergency services. Police, fire and rescue, ambulance, NHS, maritime and search and rescue. PCC Donna Jones added, Each and every day communities across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight are being helped by those who have dedicated their lives to help others. And it is right that we never lose sight of this selfless commitment. The 999 Flag Raising Day isn't a symbolic gesture alone. It's also a call to action, serving as a reminder that the safety and security of our communities are collective responsibilities and that by working together, we can all play an active role in preserving the peace. This is Petrina reading from Isle of Wight Radio. Isle of Wight COVID booster vaccinations brought forward after new variant discovered. The rollout of the annual flu jab and COVID-19 booster vaccination has been pushed forward a month on the Isle of Wight. Vaccinations have been made available from today, Monday, September the 11th, after a new coronavirus variant has emerged and is becoming more prominent. Health bodies are warning the variant is the most concerning since Omicron was first detected at the end of 2021. Where it is possible, both flu and Covid boost jabs will be given at the same time. The NHS has initially announced vaccinations would start later in October, but as a precautionary measure to protect the most vulnerable from illness, it has made the jabs available sooner. Earlier this week, Dr Michelle Legg, Island GP and a clinical director on the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Integrated Care Board, said the island is seeing an increase in COVID cases and health bodies were expecting to see greater levels of COVID this winter.
than last year. She advised those eligible to come forward for vaccination as it was the best way to prevent cases and stop the spread of the infection. Those eligible for the vaccinations remain unchanged. Those in clinical risk groups and people aged over 65, as well as frontline health and social care workers. The island's director of public health, Simon Bryant, also said the flu vaccine was also important for two to three year olds as well. Adult care home residents, housebound individuals, and those most at risk will receive vaccine first, Mr. Bryant said. From September the 18th, the national booking system will become available for people to book a COVID-19 vaccine online or they can be booked through the NHS app or by calling the COVID number 119. The aim, Mr Bryant said, is to get as many people vaccinated as possible by the end of March, although the vaccination programme will run into the new year. The UK Health Secretary Agency has said, while the new variant is not yet classified as a concern, speeding up the winter vaccine programmes will deliver greater protection and reduce the potential impact on the NHS. This article is from the Isle of Wight Radio and is read by Howard and concerns the Morocco earthquake rescue. Five specialist firefighters from Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service have been deployed to Morocco following Friday night's devastating earthquake. They're part of a team of 60 UK search and rescue specialists deployed by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office who arrived in Morocco along with specialist equipment and four search dogs. The UK International Search and Rescue, that's UK ISAR team, is made up of firefighters and staff from 14 fire and rescue services from across the country. The Hampshire team will be managing base operations for the UK firefighting personnel in Morocco, ensuring the welfare and safety of those involved in the search operations during this vital time. Chief Fire Officer at HIWFRS Neil Odin said, The devastation caused by this earthquake has been heartbreaking to see, and our thoughts are with all those affected. Having dedicated specialists, highly skilled firefighters who can respond to a disaster of this nature and scale at a moment's notice has meant that we're able to be part of the UK response team during this vital time. Our USAR team have formed part of the ISAR response to recent incidents such as the earthquake in Turkey and the building collapse in Jersey. The HIWFRS team has set up the base operations in Amit Smith. UK ISAR is part of the National Fire Chiefs Council, NFCC, National Resilience Work, and is on permanent standby to mobilise and assist when requested by disaster-affected countries. The UK ISAR team responds primarily to overseas urban search and rescue emergencies on behalf of the UK. Any UK ISAR team deployed is self-sufficient upon arrival and provides its own food, water, shelter, sanitation, communications and all necessary equipment to undertake search and rescue operations for up to 14 days. This is to ensure no additional burden is placed upon a country already suffering demands on its resources following a sudden onset disaster. An advertisement National Fire Chiefs Council Chair Mark Hardingham said, The thoughts of the UK's fire and rescue services are with all those affected by the devastating earthquake in Morocco. A team of specially trained firefighters and medics from the UK has been deployed to assist following a request from the Moroccan government to the British government. They will be providing specialist technical support where it's needed most to save lives and support local emergency service teams. Newport Football Club continue community initiatives 
with pantry donations from the island Echo, read by Joyce. Newport Football Club has made its first deliveries of matchday food bank collections to local food pantries. The Wessex League Club is asking fans to bring along donations of food and essentials to the home games it plays at Beatrice Avenue in East Cowles. Stephen Rackett, chairman of Newport Football Club Supporters Trust, has said, As a community-owned football club, it, we felt it was important to help out islanders in need in these difficult times. And so at the start of the season, we began the food bank collections. We have been overwhelmed with the generous response of our supporters, who have clearly backed this initiative enthusiastically. The club have already made deliveries to Pyle Street Pantry in Newport and last week it was the turn of Pan Together to receive donations from the club's supporters. Rachel Thompson, Pan Together's Community Centre Manager, has said, We are absolutely delighted to receive such generous support for our community larder from our local football club, Newport Isle of Wight Football Club and their fans. Donations such as these are really welcome and make a vital and direct difference to the charity's work in our local area when the cost of living crisis is biting so very hard for so many people. The Pan Community Larder is open from 12 noon to 2pm each Tuesday and Friday at Downsite Community Centre for residents of Pan, Pan Meadows, Barton and Fairley. Membership is free and members pay £5 per week at per, f- per weekly visit for two carrier bags of fresh, frozen, refrigerated, tinned and dried food and other household essentials which they chose for themselves. No one needs a referral. For further details, phone 0198324800. One seven zero. That's o one nine eight three two four eight one zero. The club continues its community pr- approach this weekend, in is participating in Isle of Wight Day by offering half price entry for NH work NHS workers. Its home matches. On Saturday, the 16th of September, 3 pm. This article was read by Joyce. This is Michael reading an article from Isle of Wight Radio. Popular and historic Shanklin Tea Room could close. A popular Isle of Wight Tea Room is an historic building in Shanklin could close. Vernon Cottage on East Cliff Road in Shanklin Old Village has been a staple of local life since the 1960s. For the last two years, owners Mr and Mrs P. De Vere have been trying to sell their business. It currently employs one full-time member of staff and nine part-timers. Despite price reductions, their bid has not been successful and now a planning application has been submitted which could mean the Grade 2 listed tea room and garden becomes a house. The top floor of the cottage is already a private flat but the proposals could mean all commercial areas are removed and the building is restored to its original use as a home. Built in 1817 with later extensions it is located in the designated Shanklin Conservation Area. Proposals show internal work could include removing modern fixtures and fittings, including partition walls. A games room and garden room are proposed for where the shop is. A dining stroke family room and lounge could replace the tea room and a home study and office would replace the current toilets for customers. 
In planning documents submitted to the Isle of Wight Council, Andrew White, planning consultancy on behalf of the De Vere's, says the proposal would mean little physical change and would not harm the historic building's appearance and character. You can view the plans on the Isle of Wight's Council's planning register. Comments can be submitted until September the 29th. This is Petrina reading from the Island Echo. Islander speaks out about stress of travelling to the mainland for hospital treatment. It is all getting too much and the stress keeps building up, are the words of an Isle of Wight woman who has had to frequently travel to the mainland with her partner for hospital treatment. Speaking to the Isle of Wight's Council's Health and Social Care Scrutiny Committee, Islander Paula told members about the troubles encountered by her partner Chris and herself as they travelled to the mainland for treatment. Chris has suffered with chronic kidney failure for four years and is now on dialysis three or four times a day while being under the care of the Queen Alexandra Hospital in Portsmouth for scans and treatment. Paula says she tries to look after Chris the best she can as he is unable to be put on the transplant list. Speaking to the committee, Paula said, Chris suffers from anxiety a lot on the ferry. It is not nice what he goes through. With White Link, it has been very difficult. He feels very aware of his condition. The fares, she said, were astronomical with very little financial help. And although it is more comfortable for Chris to travel by car, it was not financially viable to do so in the long term. Even if they did cross by car, Chris would not be able to stay in the vehicle for the full crossing. In March, Paula said Chris had a relapse, but because St Mary's Hospital in Newport doesn't have the facility for Chris's type of dialysis treatment, he had to be taken to Portsmouth by ambulance. However, he had to wait two days before there was a space for an ambulance on the ferry, she said, and Chris was left waiting in a corridor in St Mary's. She said, We are both in our late 60s. It is all getting too much and this white link business is just building up stress. The money side of it, waiting for the ferries, but then they change the times. Chris has had to leave treatment early, Paula said, in the winter, so they would not miss the last fast cat home. Moving forward, Paula said she would like to see somewhere on the ferries and passenger services for ill patients. A quiet zone with accessible toilets so that those undergoing treatment can feel comfortable and relaxed. Councillor Claire Mosdale, the Isla White Councillor's former Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Public Health, said discounts were not helpful when the prices of ferries fluctuate during peak seasons. She said there needs to be a set, reasonable amount people are charged all year round so that they can afford to make the journey and don't end up spending their life savings just to have a treatment which if you lived on the mainland wouldn't have the same cost attached. Darren Cattell from the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Integrated Care Board said it was a long-standing issue but some progress had been made with a commitment from each of the ferry operators to meet with representatives of patient groups, Health Watch, Isle of Wight and other statutory bodies. This article is from the Island Echo and is read by Howard and concerns super yacht cadetship courses. The UKSA has announced 80% of the September intake for its super yacht cadetship course and are receiving funding in a move to ensure the maritime industry is acceptable to as many young people as possible. The Isle of Wight-based charity, 
which provides life-enhancing water-based adventures, education and world-leading maritime training, has provided over half of the funding towards course fees, an average of £12,000, enabling students from all backgrounds to take part in its flagship maritime training programme. Available to those aged 18 to 25, the structured four-year programme, which this year sees 42 students start in September, that's an increase of 13% from the previous year, is designed to train the future officer of the super yacht industry and was created with the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, that's the MCA. It equips graduates with a strong foundation of knowledge alongside offering a realistic understanding of what it takes to succeed in a career in the super yacht industry. James Potiphar, Cadet Chief Manager at UKSA said, UKSA is incredibly proud to enable the funding of 80% of our super yacht cadetship students, thanks to our incredible sponsors, Edmiston, the Seafarers Charity, TK Foundation, Trinity House and Olesinski, with additional funding from the Noel Lister Memorial Fund, Milo Hanlon Fund, Stephen Thomas Bursary and the Will Black Fund. We're committed to making careers in maritime as accessible as possible and removing any barriers to those who wish to pursue a career in the industry is something we'll continue to encourage and enable. This course is a fantastic alternative to university and uniquely students earn while they learn so they can pay off their course fees while they're working and training in the industry. The course is also all inclusive of food and accommodation during the training phases. So we're really making it available to as many young people as possible. Cadets additionally have the opportunity to undertake a foundation degree in operational yacht science during phase one and three of the Super Yacht Cadetship, which is awarded by the University of Plymouth. The option gives additional careers and training pathways into different sectors in the maritime industry. This course combines, uh, comprises five phases. Phase one will see cadets developing skills and knowledge of seamanship and safety, as well as industry qualifications. Phase two sees students employed on a super yacht as an entry level deckhand. Phase three progresses cadets from a junior deckhand to more senior positions on board, such as lead deckhand or boatswain, by building on their work experience. Phase four gives the cadets watchkeeping experience in a paid employment role, which will see them practically applying and honing the techniques and practices learned. Phase five is the officer of the watch 3000 GT training with cadets studying senior modules towards a final examination. Isle of Wight Care Home to become flats. From Isle of Wight Radio, read by Joyce. A former Isle of Wight Care Home, which closed last year, could have a new life as flats. In 2021, Seven Gables residential home on York Lane in Totland was found to be inadequate by Care Quality Commission inspectors who reported unsafe facilities for residents and unhappy staff. Although it won a good grade in July 2022, it closed just three months later in October 2022. The building sold at auction in November 2022 for more than £600,000. Now, Surrey-based Glycine Holdings wants to change the former 22-bed care home into 10 flats with a mix of one to four bedrooms over three floors. Planning documents submitted to the Isle of Wight Council by agent Chalkline say too much work is needed to return the building to care home use. Instead, work will preserve the most attractive features of the existing building and remedy the more unsightly historical additions, the documents say. An extension is proposed for the southwest corner of the ground floor and balconies and terraces could be added to give the flats private outdoor space. 
Chimney stacks will be removed and new windows installed. The former pool area would become extra parking spaces, including EV chargers. You can view the plans, which are 23 stroke 01539 stroke FUL on the Isle of Wight Council's planning register. Comments can be submitted until October the 6th. This is Michael reading from Island Echo. Spinlock unveils new head office at former Cowes Police Station. Isle of Wight Marine Equipment Specialist Spinlock has unveiled its impressive new headquarters at the historic landmark, Cowes Town Police Station. Spinlock, honoured with the first King's Award for innovation in April, is now operating from the 125-year-old building brought back to life following an extensive redevelopment. After almost 50 years on the Cowes waterfront in Birmingham Road, the dynamic B Corp business has moved just across the road following an 18-month renovation and extension of the formerly derelict police station to make the building fit for future growth. The transformed premises now offer modern offices and open spaces to inspire and encourage collaboration and provide a welcoming environment for Spinlock's marine clients. The addition of a contemporary design top floor provides an additional meeting and networking area for Spinlock with access to a terrace overlooking the Solent. Quirky features such as police cell doors, have been incorporated into the interior redesign and the exact blue of the original police sign has been reproduced for the Spinlock logo branding. Spinlock's chief executive, Chris Hill, said, Moving into our new larger head office is a milestone event and a real investment in Spinlock's future. Following the recent 40% expansion of our manufacturing centre in Cowes, the new head office provides the space needed to continue our growth trajectory. All our products are designed and manufactured in Cowes, and the new head office gives our design team new workshops, sampling and resources to develop new and exciting products more efficiently and to grow as a team. The expansion of our design, marketing and sales facility also enables us to continue operating and greeting clients in Cowes. The majority of our customers are spread over 66 countries and they truly value this connection and the opportunity to visit us at this iconic yachting venue. We regularly host training new product and sales and marketing conferences, and the new headquarters provides space for large groups of stakeholders to visit and develop their relationship and business with Spinlock. This exciting new phase follows the honour of Spinlock becoming the first recipient of the King's Award for Innovation and our certification as a B Corps which recognises Spinlock's high standards of social and environmental performance, transparency and accountability. Operations Director Caroline Senior said, We are delighted to be operating from our wonderful new headquarters and welcoming our global clients. It is fantastic to see the building redevelopment and the move come from fruition necessitated by our need for more space while wanting to maintain our links in this iconic Cowes location. We started looking for bigger premises before Covid and found the solution right on our doorstep. The derelict Cowes Town Police Station had been standing empty for a decade and was perfect for us. The pandemic delayed the large-scale building work but it finally got underway with an excellent construction team who brought the property back to life, repurposing a 125-year-old building 
was never going to be the easiest option, but the potential hidden within was there to be discovered. It required foresight and commitment to provide a workspace that was good for the team, our visitors and the environment. When it came to the extensive redevelopment and extension of the old police station, we were not surprised to find the knowledge and experience available locally. From developing its vision with mode design architects to working with Dave Bunday and son building team who met the demanding budget and timeline and ensured the best was made of the site reusing existing materials and using local suppliers. Together, this group worked with us to deliver a remarkable new head office for Spinlock, an investment in its future which enables us to continue with cows very much as its home and preserves a local landmark for the community. This is Petrina reading from Isle of Wight Radio. Proposed development would see more than a hundred new homes in cows. Another major development is proposed on the edge of two Isle of Wight villages, but an 11 hectare green space could be open to the public to ensure the villages do not merge. More than a hundred homes could be added to the built up environment at the top of cows as well as a suitable alternative nature green space, Sang. The plans have been submitted by Jordan Valley Estates, which is behind other housing developments in the area. The proposed sites between Gurnard and Northwood, behind Cockleton Lane, Place Road and Tuttons Hill. The residential development could be up to 117 houses, flats or maisonettes, with 76 houses on the market, 29 available for social or affordable rent and 12 under affordable home ownership. Outline consent has been sought for the residential development which would agree to the principle of houses on that site and access to them. Another application would then have to be submitted at a later date, if the first one is approved, with details of the appearance, layout, scale and landscaping. Full planning permission is being sought for the SANG, which could be preserved, public open space to retain the visual separation between Gurnard and Cowles, planning agents BCM say on behalf of Jordan Valley Estates. The Jordan Valley is seen by residents to play an essential role in maintaining the identity of Gurnard. Planning documents submitted to the Isle of Wight Council by BCM say the SANG could offer the public benefit of protecting Gurnard's identity in perpetuity. New wetlands and grassland habitats could be created for invertebrates, reptiles, birds and amphibians. The total grassland improvement area, BCM says, is nearly the same size as 10 football pitches. There would be 20 car parking spaces available for community use at the Sang. You can view the application 23 forward slash 01430 forward slash FUL on the Isle of Wight Council's planning register. Comments can be made until the October the 6th. Good morning, I'm John. And I'm Lynn. And now we're going on to articles from the County Press. Who will be our leader? Calls for end to challenges, distraction. A crucial vote will take place on Wednesday when the Isle of Wight Council leader's seat falls empty. The woman who has led the local authority since May 2021 has announced plans to step aside. Colleagues have praised her effort and passion, but critics say it is time for a change at the top. In recent months, there have been arguments about the future of education, 
councillors swapping sides and motions of no confidence raised and then dropped again. Hoping her departure will bring stability to the Isle of Wight Council's County Hall in Newport, Councillor Laura P.C. Wilcox's departures plans have prompted a leadership challenge. Who wins will come down to numbers. The councillor who heads up the Isle of Wight Council's Conservative group, is to seek election as leader of the local authority, following the resignation of Councillor Laura P.C. Wilcox. Also in the running is Councillor Phil Jordan, currently Transport and Highways lead. Who wins will be down to numbers. Councillor Jordan, a member of the Alliance, said, I am confident what the council needs now more than anything is the stability and continuity that only the current alliance administration. The current political posturing is disrupting and a complete distraction. It is quite simply political opportunism underpinned by personal aspirations and agendas. Announcing her challenge, Councillor Ellis said, The council, and indeed the island, needs leadership which is prepared to make the right and sometimes difficult decisions in a timely manner. Such leadership must also enjoy the support of a wider set of members across the council chamber. The dwindling numbers within the Alliance group suggest that it does not enjoy majority support. Since it was formed, membership of the Alliance group, a coalition of independent and green councillors, have fought fallen from 18 to 13, including losing four members in a week in May. There are now four Liberal Democrats, a Labour councillor, an independent Labour councillor and four councillors who form empowering islanders who are independent and conservative. Meanwhile, the majority Conservative group has 16 members. Councillor PC Wilcox will step aside on Wednesday before a meeting of the full council. Her decision meant a vote of no confidence was withdrawn. On Monday, she said the motion against her had become a serious distraction for the authority. Councillor PC Wilcox said, There is vital and necessary work currently being undertaken which must not be disrupted. And she thanked councillors, staff and residents. Drunk threatened to glass bystander by a court reporter. A man has been handed a jail sentence after threatening members of the public with a broken glass bottle at Newport bus station. Harrison Joseph Blake of No Fixed Abode attended Isle of Wight Crown Court for sentencing on Friday, September 8th, after previously pleading guilty to a fray and threatening a person with an offensive weapon in a public place. Michael McGoldrick, prosecuting, said police were called at 8.24pm on July 25th to reports of a male with face tattoos making threats. Mr McGoldrick told the court the victim had been waiting for a bus when he saw Blake, who appeared to be heavily intoxicated, approaching two teenage girls with two bottles of alcohol in either hand. The court was told a member of the public intervened to assist the frightened girls and Blake shouted, If you have a problem with me, let's get it sorted now. I will take you all out. The 25-year-old shouted into the face of the victim, I will F you up. I am a traveller. I will F anyone up. Mr McGoldrick said the victim pushed Blake away, which made him drop one of the glass bottles and it smashed. Blake picked up a shard and raised it to the victim's neck, telling him, I will put this in you. It will be worth eight months, the court heard. A witness said Blake had been exposing his genitals to people before the incident, Mr Goldrick told the court. When police officers arrived at the scene, Blake ran, but was chased down by a police dog, which caught up with him outside the Ireland Six form on opposite James's Street, biting him on the arm. The prosecution said Blake, who has 46 previous convictions and was only released from jail recently following a violent offence, was silent during the police interview until the very end when he told officers, no one got hurt, that's the moral of the story. 
Laura Dirksbury, defending, said her client had not been taking his mental health medication and, since the dog bite, had been suffering. Miss Dirksbury told the court Blake was concerned his appearance could count against him. Recorder Daniel Sawyer said, Your victim was frightened and scared for his life. You must have been terrifying. Blake was handed a 20-month prison sentence, which he said was fair in the dock. A driver not at fault over fatal collision. An inquest has been held into how a man died in hospital more than three weeks after a collision with a car on a pedestrian crossing. David Thomas Cairns was severely injured as he used a puffin crossing on the A3054 Binstead Hill while the traffic lights were green. The incident, seen by a number of witnesses, happened at around 10 o'clock on November the 15th, 2021. The 77-year-old retired local government officer ran from a shop and in one continuous movement went on to the crossing the inquest heard. He was struck by a Skoda driven by Matthew Orbert at a speed of no more than 25 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone. Friday's hearing <clears throat> at the Isle of Wight Coroner's Court, Newport, was told Mr Cairns replete, repeatedly told the shock driver I'm sorry before he attempted to crawl to the other side of the road. Mr Cairns was taken to St Mary's Hospital, Newport. His injuries were described by Isle of Wight coroner Caroline Sumeray as distressing. Emergency operations were required after he was transferred to Southampton General Hospital and he later suffered a heart attack. Mr Cairns died in hospital on December the 8th. Mrs Sumeray concluded Mr Cairns died from a road traffic collision. Police say Mr Obert was totally blameless. TV chef is living island dream. When a former contestant of Channel 4's Come Dine With Me, Paul Thorley, moved to the Isle of Wight, his successful background in the automotive industry meant that he quickly found outlets for his skills. Developing and supporting a range of business projects, he soon became a familiar face at island networking forums. So some may be surprised to find this popular local entrepreneur is the chef launching a new venture in Gurnard this month called The Dining Room. Paul has long been offering his highly successful private dining and supper clubs for friends, local charities and other guests. The growing popularity of these means he is now giving his culinary hobby a permanent home on Gurnard's Church Road. With his distinctive style of multi-course dining, Paul shows off his skills as he juggles the crockery in a diminutive kitchen to feed up to 16 people in the intimate venue. The dining room is open now and offers private hire, supper clubs and special Sunday social lunches. Diners watch the chef preparing the food before tucking in. Paul said, I've always loved food at times too much. I left school and went to catering college, but I didn't pursue this as a career choice. In 2012, I started to cook again and got my passion back in a big way. Moving to the island, my dream was to become a private chef here and continue my supper clubs. I did both with huge success. Now the universe is aligned to bring me into my own dedicated space, a truly amazing and unique venue where I can hold my regular supper clubs, the dining room in Gurnard. Raw sewage was released into open water on the Isle of Wight thousands of times last year, figures show, including when it was not raining hard. Storm overflows normally happen when the sewage system is at risk of being overwhelmed, such as after heavy rain or during higher levels of groundwater. In these cases, water companies say they may need to release excess water and sewage into rivers and the sea to prevent water backing up into streets and homes. 
This has an impact on the quality of our natural water sources, although the firms argue it is minimal. Figures from the Environment Agency show storm overflows were used 2,253 times within the Isle of Wight's local authority boundaries in 2022, discharging for a total of around 16,787 hours. All of these spills were from Southern Waters Network, though these figures may not provide a full picture of the amount of water pollution in the area. The Isle of Wight may also be impacted by overspills from areas it shares water sources with. The Rivers Trust said it was particularly concerned by storm overflows being used during hot periods. Tessa Wardley, Director of Communications and Advocacy at the charity, said, Discharging untreated sewage in dry weather is bad for both human health and river health. Lower river flows mean more concentrated pollutants at a time when more people want to enjoy their rivers, she added. Southern Water saw 16,688 overspills across its network in 2022, with 96% of the company's facilities reporting overspill data last year. In total, there were more than 300,000 overspills across England in 2022, a 19% reduction on last year though this may be a reflection of weather conditions rather than improved infrastructure. Rock Legend Drops In For A Fish Supper by Oliver Dyer Rock legend and Queen guitarist Sir Brian May was pictured enjoying a visit to the Isle of Wight. The legendary musician paid a trip to the reef in Sandown on Tuesday, September the 12th. A post on the restaurant's Facebook page said he had fish and chips and enjoyed drinks with friends. The rock star posed for a picture with the Payne family, Michael, Emma and Josh, who owned the reef. He even went for a dip in the sea afterwards, the post said. It read, Wow, we've been honoured to meet Brian May today. What a lovely man. He loved the food and fantastic service and loved the beach so much he went across for a paddle afterwards. Sir Brian May also visited the island in 2016 when Queen headlined the Isle of Wight Festival alongside Adam Lambert. Sandown Siege Man Jailed A serial offender involved in a police siege at his home and who made threats to infect officers with hepatitis B has been given three months to prove he shouldn't go to prison. Jamie Lee of Avenue Road, Sandown, appeared at the Isle of Wight Crown Court on Thursday, September the 7th. In May, the 31-year-old admitted a fray and damage to a property in Sandown. Prosecutor Shona Probert told the court the charges related to a domestic incident. On April 21st, 2021, at around 2.40pm, a witness with a child recalled seeing a female in distress in the street. Court was told Lee shouted and threatened the victim before going on to direct threats at the witness. He threatened to smash her head in and the police were called. Sometime later, officers attended Lee's home address in what was described as something of a siege. Lee refused to leave and was confrontational, leaning out of a window holding kitchen knives and making threats. I'm going to burn your whole family, said Lee. Court was told he threw objects out of the window and lauded his own marksmanship after striking the windscreen of a police van, remarking what a shot. He was also said to have been holding a syringe containing red liquid and threatening to infect people with hepatitis B. Miss Probert said Lee had 39 previous convictions for 70 offences and a history of violence, criminal damage and acts of dishonesty. Michael McAldrick, defending, said Lee had made considerable progress towards getting clean of drugs while on remand in prison and asked for an opportunity for him to continue that good work. He said Lee expressed clear remorse and shame and had been in a haze of drugs 
at the time of the offences. The court heard Lee unusually asked for an opportunity to do unpaid work to give him a purpose. Mr McCaldrick said he was ripe to be rehabilitated, had plans to secure employment and his priority was to remain drug free. Lee's sentence was deferred to December the 13th. Concrete Stands Test of Time by Lucy Morgan Concrete housing built to last is right here on the island. On the island we have the first concrete housing built in Victorian times. These are an unassuming pair of semi-detached houses on the main road near the entrance to Osborne House in East Cowes. Once there were two pairs, but the second pair was severely damaged in 1942 when a bomb landed nearby. The concrete houses were constructed of the new Medina cement, developed at the Stag Lane Cement Works on the River Medina in the 1840s. The Romans had made the first cement, which is made from a mixture of lime and clay. The first patent in Britain for, quote, Roman, unquote, cement was in 1796. By 1830, firms around the Medway in Kent were making cement. They called it Portland cement, as when set, it, look, it looked like Portland stone. On the west bank of the Medina, similar pioneering cement was being produced in the 1840s. Calling it Medina cement, this had quick-setting properties. One part of cement could be mixed with six parts of washed gravel, making concrete. This was useful for building structures in the sea. Wooden planking, called shuttering, made a former into which the concrete was poured. Within four hours the concrete was set, which was very useful in tidal conditions. Medina Dock at West Cowes was completed using this concrete in 1846 and a 200-foot groin was made in 1851 at Sandown Bay. The manager of the East Cowes Botanic Gardens development, Richard Langley, had the concrete houses constructed in 1852. The development, called East Cowes Park, was designed around a triangle of wide roads which still form the main road structure today. This was once a private gated community of large expensive houses, the gates keeping out the lower classes of society, unless they were delivering goods. Just a few of the stone-built mansions still exist, such as Powys House, but one pair of the concrete houses at the top of York Avenue remains. They were built using the shuttering system for their external walls. The walls are between 12 inches and 14 inches thick, around 30 centimetres. The mouldings around the doors and windows are all of concrete. Even the chimneys were concrete, but they were sadly dismantled in 1980. In 1852, it was felt a concrete house would be more durable than brick and certainly these buildings have lasted well, a lot longer than those of RAAC. The proprietor of the Medina Cement Works, A.J. Francis, wrote about cement making history up until 1914. They had exhibited their Medina Cement at the Great Exhibition of 1851. In 1900, 26 companies, including Medina Cement, amalgamated to form Associated Portland Cement Manufactories. The Medina Works stopped manufacturing in 1946. The office of the cement mills near the railway line may have been the first experiment with such shattered walls, mm -hmm. but Francis says it was not until the 1860s that houses were constructed in situ. He had obviously forgotten the East Cowes houses. So here on the island we have the earliest known shuttered concrete homes in Britain, and so probably in the world. 
To find out more, visit Isle of Wight History Centre online and look at the Cement Mills Information Board along the Cows to Newport Cycleway. Visitors find areas closed at Osborne. Visitors to the Isle of Wight's Osborne House were unable to access two of the estate's historic collections last week. Part of the Swiss cottage was first shut last month, while the nursery in the main house was closed at short notice. English Heritage, which runs the site, has told the county press a water leak is behind the Swiss cottage partial closure. Preventative measures had to be taken by staff, which saw items removed from the collection for protection. Water was leaking through its wooden roof onto the top floor. David Bailey, Head of Historic Properties at Osborne, said the upper floor of Swiss Cottage is now closed to enable conservation work to take place, but visitors can still enjoy the ground floor and the museum at Swiss Cottage. From November the 6th, Swiss Cottage and the museum will be closed as part of our normal winter opening hours. Meanwhile, the reason behind the nursery closure is staff shortages, Mr Bailey added. He said, when our team are occasionally short-staffed, we may need to close a room at short, short notice, and as was the case with the nursery earlier this week. The nursery has since reopened. For the most up-to-date information on opening hours, visitors are urged to check the website. Loo work means spending more pennies. Public toilets in Newport Town Centre could be refurbished, although it could mean some taxpayers having to fork out more. The South Street loos near the bus station are next, on the list to be done up by Newport and Carisbrook Community Council. The council would like to see them improved, as they are still very well used. The Community Council refurbished the loos in Post Office Lane two years ago. However, improving the South Street toilets could require a significant increase to taxpayers' bills in Newport and Carisbrook, it says. The Community Council is asking residents if they would be happy to foot the bill. Based on the costs of the Post Office Lane project, the council says the South Street refurbishment could increase bills by 5% over a 12 to 15 year loan period before any of the council's usual cost pressures are taken into account. A Ban D taxpayer in Newport and Carisbrook pays £90.77p a year towards the activities of the community council. With the proposed rise, a bandy bill could go up by roughly £4.54p in the first year to a total of £95.31p. Councillors Julie Jones-Evans and Vix Lowthian said there are still many questions to be answered about the complex South Street toilets before a proper public consultation could start. The RSPCA, Isle of Wight, releases dog cruelty numbers. They may be man's best friend, but there were 108 reports made to the RSPCA, Isle of Wight, about cruelty towards dogs last year. The heartbreaking figure includes 18 reports made about intentional harm, neglect and abandonment. Intentional harm includes attempted killing, poisoning, beating, improper killing, mutilation and suspicious circumstances. The figure has been released as part of the National Charities Cancel Out Cruelty campaign in a bid to raise funds to help its frontline rescue teams continue to save animals from cruelty and abuse. However, many people are unaware that the Isle of Wight branch is a local charity that has to raise all funds from its activities on the island. Their busy animal centre is at Bohemia Corner between Godshill and Rookley at the junction of Merston Lane. You can help the charity in various ways. Of course, you can donate money. All donations are welcome, however small or large. And the charity will use it to provide the most critical animal need, including veterinary care, medical treatment, 
or enrichment programmes for an animal which needs rehabilitation. You can also donate goods that the charity can sell through their charity shops or use to support the animals in their care, help with fundraising, leave a legacy or adopt or foster an animal. Just get in touch with them on 840287 or email them at reception at rspca-isleofwhite.org.uk to make a donation, go to iow.life forward slash rspca. Holmes Plan Next to Nature Reserve by Louise Hill. Dozens of homes could be built on land next to a nature reserve. Outline consent is being sought for around 45 flats and houses on the outskirts of Ryde, near Alfred Street's allotments and off Quarry Road. The plans, submitted by Veronica Kelland, are for a 1.6 hectare site near Monkton Mead Brook, the Island Line Railway Line and the Pig Lake Lane Nature Reserve. The proposals are for a mix of regular housing, affordable home ownership schemes and housing association run rentals. The land used to be agricultural fields, an orchard and patches of woodland, although planning documents say it is now overgrown with scrub and brambles. It neighbours the Pig Leg Lane Nature Reserve, an area of woodland and meadow on the southern edge of Ride, which is managed by a charity, Gift to Nature. Protected and priority species have also been noted on the proposed development site, although it has been included in the Isle of Wight Council's draft planning strategy, with an allocation of at least 30 houses. As part of the plans, tanks to collect and store excess surface water runoff will be included in the drainage strategy to fix flooding and small corridors for wildlife to get through the site to the allotments could be included. The application is for outline planning consent, which means only the principle of housing and access is up for approval. If the green light is given, a further application, with details including appearance, landscaping, layout and scale, would have to be submitted including the final number of houses. Documents submitted to the Isle of Wight Council by Andrew White Planning Consultancy on behalf of Miss Kelland say the plans, particularly how the built environment interacts with the natural one, have been carefully considered. The planning agent says the development would be seen as a natural extension of Alfred Street and Quarry Road with open spaces, nature areas and parking for users of the adjoining Pig Leg Lane Nature Reserve. View 23 forward slash 01476 forward slash out on the Isle of Wight Council's planning register. Comments can be submitted until October the 6th. Army man on binged abused pub drinkers. A former soldier who was on an all-day drinking binge at an Isle of Wight pub before hurling abuse at a bartender who refused to sell him more alcohol has been sentenced. Scott O'Brien of Russell Road Shawwell had previously pleaded guilty to using threatening, abusive or insulting words, behaviour with intent to cause fear or provoke unlawful violence. He attended sentencing at the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court on Friday, September the 8th. Lauren Stone, prosecuting, said the 53-year-old had been drinking at the Crown Inn on Walker's Lane Shawwell on April the 16th with an ex-military friend. By 7pm, when customers were arriving for dinner, the pair were being loud at the bar and when new staff took over the shift in the evening, they refused to sell O'Brien any more alcohol, said Miss Stone. The prosecution told the court O'Brien used offensive language 
and told random patrons at the pub, F off, we fought for you. What have you ever done for this country? In a statement read out to the court by Mrs Stone, the victim said, I was worried and scared violence would be used against me. Michael McGoldrick, defending, described his client's response at disproportionate and inappropriate, suggesting O'Brien would benefit from the probation service. O'Brien is ex-military and suffers PTSD after serving in Northern Ireland, said Mr McGoldrick. The defence told the court O'Brien had been given a five-year ban by Pubwatch but said that he is not prone to drinking large amounts of alcohol. Magistrates told O'Brien they appreciate the service he has done for his country and handed him a nine-month community order with a £140 fine, a surcharge of £114 and costs of £85. See too warm for oyster plan. An Isle of Wight project which will see oysters put in the Solent had to be postponed due to the sea being too warm. UKSA, in partnership with the Blue Marine Foundation, plans to hang baskets of the, quote, ecosystem engineers, unquote, in the water beneath its pontoons. The aim is to aid the restoration with breeding and growing of oysters in high densities. The release was planned for Wednesday, September 13th. However, it has had to be pushed back for a few weeks. UKSA has said, although the Solent is only one degree hotter than usual, there is a big difference in the temperature of water here compared to where the oysters are now. For example, in Scotland, where some of the oysters are from, the temperature of the water is 12 degrees colder. A spokesperson said, it means the oysters won't be able to acclimatise. It is hoped the introduction of oysters will facilitate the release of millions of larvae into the Solent, while also providing refuge for other marine life, including endangered European eels, young seahorse and sea bass. Research shows oysters provide a range of benefits to the environment and people, such as improving water quality, with a single oyster able to filter up to 200 litres of water every day. They also act as a natural defence to coastal erosion. HSE investigates serious injury. The Health and Safety Executive are investigating a crushing incident at, on Monday in which a member of staff at Lim Bottom Tip received serious injuries. At 7.26am, the Hampshire and Isle of Wight Air Ambulance dispatched a critical care team to the Waste Centre on Briddlesford Road. The injured employee was given medical treatment at the scene and then transported to Southampton Hospital. A spokesman for Thalia, the company that operates the waste disposal and recycling site, said, Following Monday's incident at Lim Bottom, we can confirm a colleague was injured and is receiving medical support. This incident is under investigation and it would be inappropriate to comment any further at this stage. Our thoughts are with our injured colleague and we send thanks to the emergency services for their quick response. New dental plan for ex-bathroom business. Instead of tiles, it's teeth, as a dentist moves location and a plan to turn an entire building into scrap flats is scrapped. What used to be Atlantis Heating and Plumbing bathroom showroom in Wooden Bridge will have a new life in the coming weeks as a dental practice. Rides Tower House is moving into former bathroom showroom under the name Isle of Wight Dental Clinic. It follows the Isle of Wight Council's refusal of plans to turn the showroom into flats. Work is already underway to transform the ground floor space, but planning permission is also being sought for more flats at the High Street building. 
The building already has two second floor apartments and owner Alex Cousins wants two more in both the loft and an extension. In documents submitted to the Isle of Wight Council, agent Elmstone Architectural says it has revised the proposals in line with the planning officer's comments. The agent said the plans would support the town's high street as the shop front would be retained and there would be much needed dental facilities for islanders. View 23 forward slash 01532 forward slash FUL on the Isle of Wight Council's website and comments until October 6. And now we move on to nostalgia. Unsung hero Walter Sibick by Alan Stroud. Here we shine a spotlight on one of the Isle of Wight's unsung heroes, Walter Sibick. He joined the county press in 1902 as an office clerk, became editor in 1945 and retired in 1960. During that time and beyond, he also contributed his wonderful Vectinus column under the pen name. He contributed literally thousands of articles covering all aspects of rural life on the island from A to Z. Unimpressed by circumstances of birth, Vectinus was just as likely to include a generous obit of hurdle making living in the woods as he was to cover the death of a member of the island establishment. His articles remain an undiscovered treasure trove of information about our island and deserve a book of their own. In 1925, Sibic wrote, a local fisherman, Mr. F. Bastini, informs me that crabs, if removed from their accustomed feeding place and dropped in the water many miles away, will quickly find their way back. On one occasion, he caught crabs at Knighton, marked them, dropped them at Freshwater, and in a day or two, caught them again at Knighton. Is that right? Can any reader confirm the truth, or otherwise, of that story? In 1940, some jokes lifted the wartime gloom. Neighbour, how many controls are there on your new radio set? Owner, well, let me see. There's my mother-in-law, my wife and my daughter. Admiring a big gathering, a speaker said boldly, Gentlemen, I have been born an Englishman. I have lived an Englishman and I hope I may die an Englishman. A Scotsman in the audience retorted, Mon ha ye no ambition. In 1952, overheard at Sandown Zoo, Daddy, if that lion got out and ate you, what number bus would I have to catch to get home? Sibic was a prolific source of local history, such as this in 1958. Mr Edwin Holbrook of Bethel Cottage, Porchfield is 85, but has a very good memory. All the water mills around the town in 1870s were working. After harvest and gleaning in the fields, I remember helping my mother carry the wheat to Towngate Mill to be ground into flour. Mr Ballard was a baker near the Troopers Inn, close by, and he used to send bread to Porchfield once a week in the miller's wagon. At every entrance to Newport there were toll gates, with one at the top of Honey Hill. The farmers strongly objected to paying toll, and one day a farmer sent his carter with a load of corn for the mill and told him not to pay toll under any circumstances, and if the gate was closed against him, he was to put a chain on it and rip it out of the way. The gate was closed, so the carter hitched the horses onto it and smashed it to matchwood. In his column in January 1958, Sibick demolished a piece of island folklore. Some of my readers were surprised to see in Saturday's Daily Express, in an article dealing with redundancy in the Saunders Row factories, that islanders are known as corkheads. The term calf has long been in common usage, but this is the first time I have encountered corkhead. Sibick was an acknowledged expert in island traditions and folklore. 
If he had never heard the word corkhead prior to that date, then the word is nothing more than a 1950s invention. A word search for corkhead or Colkhead on the County Press Archive website from 1884 to 1958 backs him up. The word is nowhere to be found. In February 1958, Vectensis wrote, My reference to the cow's tornado last week has brought me a contemporary account of the storm in a cutting from the graphic of October 7, 1876. The first indication of the calamity was the appearance of great numbers of birds flying about in alarm. Then, at about 8.30am, there came a violent, rushing wind, about a hundred foot in width, which lasted only a few seconds, but in that short time it accomplished an almost incredible amount of destruction. Houses were unroofed or blown down, trees torn up, and the air was thick with flying slates and branches. At Cowes, the railway station was wrecked and many carriages damaged. The Globe and Marine hotels were almost demolished and the whole town suffered very severely. The town appeared as if it had undergone a bombardment. In 1961, Vectensis came face to face with the future. Last week I made my first close acquaintance with a combine harvester when I watched Scott Blake and his men cutting a field of barley at Blackwater. My mind went back to my boyhood when I was thrilled to lead the trace hoss while the sheaves were loaded on the wagon, or when the mowers, wielding their scythes with a regular swish, laid the cut corn in neat swathes, and intervals stopped at the cry of wet to draw their whetstones and strike a sweet ringing note as they sharpen their blades. Today's changes left me with a nostalgia for the more peaceful, more musical harvesting of yore. And now we go to public information from Bob Seeley, the Isle of Wight MP. Cleaning up. Under nationalisation, water company investment totalled 2.5 billion per year. After privatisation, investment jumped to 5 billion per year. Now, under this Conservative government, water companies will invest another 56 billion over 25 years to reduce sewage overflows. Vast sums of money are going into cleaning up our environment. Here are some facts. Back in the 1990s, only 27% of bathing waters nationally met minimum standards. Now 98% do. On the island, the Environment Agency, which monitors water qualities, say that 15 island beaches regularly checked, 13 are excellent, the highest standard and two are good. In 2010, shortly after the European Commission took the Labour government to court over water pollution, less than 1 in 10 discharges were monitored. Next year, every single one is due to be monitored, but there is more to do. The government has told water firms they must reduce storm overflows. On the island, we've persuaded Southern Water to make us an example of national best practice. They are investing tens of millions in water and wastewater infrastructure on the island, aligning pipes, increasing capacity, carrying out street works and offering slow release water butts. In the past month, I have been out in Cows and East Cows dropping off thousands of letters asking eligible residents to take up the offer of a free slow release water butt. The slow release butts are free and a way that everyone can help. More innovative schemes will come online in the months and years to come. As a keen swimmer, I hate the idea of polluted seas. Despite inaccurate claims, there have been significant improvements of our environment and the Conservatives' Environment Act, combined with our national plan for water, will mean a sea change in environmental improvement. Our water and air are set to be cleaner than they have been for decades, if not since the Victorians. 
As I say, these are facts and thanks to the deal we negotiated, the island is likely to see those improvements first, all part of getting a better deal for the island. There's lots of good stuff happening and when Southern Water does the right thing, I'll support them. But if and when they don't, I'll always demanding higher standards. We now have what's on. Every Wednesday and Saturday this month at Shanklin Chine, you can enjoy afternoon tea and listen to live jazz. Entry to the <coughs> tea rooms is free. And for more information, you can telephone 01983 866 432. Jack up the 80s with the Zoots, 7.30, from glam rock to disco, Motown to two-tone, you can't help grooving to the sounds of the 70s. This is at Shanklin Theatre. Please call the box office on 566837. Sorry, that is on the 22nd of September. Events on at Medina Theatre. On Friday 22nd of September, as Bridget Christie in a... Um, entertainment entitled Who Am I? Tickets are £21, that's 7.30pm. Saturday 23rd of September, it's Tango Tells a Tale, the Argentinian tango show. Tickets are £15 and £13 for concessions, that's also 7.30pm. Saturday 30th of September, we have Blake in concert, tickets £28, £25 concessions, 7.30pm. Saturday 14th of October at 7.30pm, Abba Mania, tickets £28, 50p. Thursday 19th of October at 730 The Unravelling Wilburys, tickets at £20. And lastly, Friday 20th of October at 7.30pm, Emilio Santoro as Elvis, tickets £28.50 or £26 for concessions. The Isle of Wight Literacy Festival has something for everyone. Whether it be crime or romance, sport or politics, history or food, the Isle of Wight Literacy Festival has something for you. The festival is being held in, at o Northwood House Cows from October the 5th to the 8th and tickets are on sale now. There are some huge names on the programme this year from the island's own Dame Sheila Hancock talking about her 90 years to the exciting musical finale on the Sunday starring another national treasure Maureen Lippman. We're fortunate to have these world-class artists at a grand finale to our 2023 Literacy Festival. This will be a hugely popular event, so book early to avoid disappointment. And that's not forgetting the BBC's Justin Webb, best-selling author Michael Moore Poger, and actress Lydia Leonard, who starred in The Crown and Gentleman Jack, who will be speaking about how to bring an audio book to life. New this year is LitFest, a section of the festival devoted to food and drink. Top names appearing include food writer Rosemary Schrager and wine expert on BBC Saturday Kitchen, Helen McGinn. One of the island's top chefs, Robert Thompson, will be dis demonstrating some of his recipes. Tickets are available now from isleofwhite.life slash iwhitelitfest. And on Wednesday 20th of September, there's an organ concert at 7pm. This is by Justin L. Addington of the First Baptist Church of Savannah, USA. He'll perform a one-hour programme at St. Helens Church, Eddington Road, Seaview. You can get more details at uh, andrewbradstock at hotmail.com or telephone 07503-200630. And now we move on to our letter section. Out of control planning from Hilary Webster of Northwood. Once again, the planning committee is looking to rubber stamp a London property firm's proposal 
for a housing estate on Greenfield land on the village of Northwood. Not for 66 houses this time, but at least 72. Why is this out of control committee insisting on turning island vi villages into small towns and joining them up to neighbouring villages and towns? Will the county council build a new school and medical facility? No, of course not. The main Newport to Cowes Road will be inundated with heavy plant traffic via the only access road to the estate. 25 of these houses will be offered as affordable, leaving at least 47 out of reach for local families. Why is Greenfield land, in this case historically grazing land, always in the sights of these people? I think it's high time they publish details of development plans in their area. Before anyone shouts, NIMBY in my direction, I would like to respectfully say that if I or the majority of my neighbours wanted to live in the middle of a housing estate with our country views taken away, we would move to one. One last thing, what is a London developer's definition of affordable? Road closures disruptive from Chris Biles of Newport. I was interested to read Patrick Costello's letter in the County Press 1st of September. To begin with, it is always a welcome experience to find out the geographical spread of our readership, with this being the first time in my own memory that I've come across a contribution in your letters column from the Emerald Isle. As someone who has made frequent visits to Southern Ireland, stretching over the best part of 50 years, and having experienced the transformation of that country's road network during that period, it was instructive to read Patrick Costello's assessment on the state of our island's road system, albeit in a few specific areas. While I'd prefer to reserve judgment on Mr Costello's observations about cyclists in relation to traffic flows, I guess local traffic planners will know far better than a lay observer like myself that providing a trade-off between locals and visitors wanting to travel by environmentally sustainable means, for which cycling plays a major role, and the many road users who wish to get from A to B as quickly as possible, is always going to be a delicate one. If managing such traffic demands during holiday peaks needs to be added into this equation, it amazes me as Mr Costello articulated himself, that so many roadwork schemes, with their resultant diversions and one-way traffic flows, seem to pop up during the very part of the year when peak time visitor traffic demand would suggest such disruption should be kept to a minimum. When I was travelling by bus last week between Newport and Freshwater to find the route west of Yarmouth was unavailable for the upteenth occasion, forcing yet another diversion via Wilmingham Lane, the thought crossed my mind as to whether island roads fully appreciate that we are meant to be a tourist island, and frequent closure of the same stretch is not only irritating, but potentially disruptive to the businesses which might otherwise benefit from passing trade. Wood Island Roads explain why, on at least half a dozen occasions since the start of the year, and on three or more occasions during the summer, the core bus route west of Yarmouth has been unavailable so often. I simply cannot understand why the same section of road ends up being closed or otherwise unavailable to bus traffic so frequently, particularly when many of these episodes are occurring during the peak summer season. Staff member kept a cool head from Roland Payne of Chillerton. I want to record my praise for a member of the Whitelink staff who was working on the 3.20pm Portsmouth Fishbourne Car Ferry on Sunday, September the 3rd. On arrival in Fishbourne, the ramp for unloading vehicles became stuck, which delayed our departure. A member of staff on the upper car deck where I was walked along the deck to inform us about what had happened 
and to give reassurance that the problem was in hand and we would not be delayed for too long. However, one passenger became irate and directed their fury at that member of staff who remained calm and continued to try to explain the situation despite the drawn out vocal assault. Other passengers rallied round the member of staff with commendation for the reasoned manner in which the situation was dealt with. Too often we hear complaints about the service we receive from large companies, but on this occasion there was a shining example of a young employee displaying a cool head and dignified composure in the face of a shameful, thoughtless and unprovoked verbal attack. I am sure on this occasion that employee was consoled by the fact that all the other passengers behaved in a reasonable manner and accepted the explanation and assurance they were given. What is the NHS coming to? The writer supplied their name and address. My 78-year-old friend with Alzheimer's had severe back pain and couldn't put her feet to the floor. The GP came to see her and said she needed an x-ray. Fine, except that the hospital was told they were too busy and couldn't do it for six days. Six days of pain away. So the x-ray was done and my friend sent home with the information that it might be a problem with her femur. But they didn't x-ray the femur as it wasn't named on the request form. The next day, another visit from the doctor, who said my friend needed to be in hospital. He arranged the ambulance. Fast forward to 2am the next morning. The hospital got on the phone to my friend's husband, saying, We are discharging your wife, can you come and fetch her? To which the reply was, No, I'm 80 years old and do not drive at night. At 3am, my friend arrived home in a wheelchair, inside a taxi, with no carer or helper, despite her confusion having Alzheimer's, just the taxi driver to help get her out of the taxi and up several steps into the house. Whereupon, my friend's husband had to pay the taxi driver £40. What is the NHS coming to that in the middle of the night they decide to send a poorly 78-year-old lady home in a taxi that her husband has to pay for? Weeds Taking Over by Ken Ratcliffe of Shanklin As a resident of the Isle of Wight who enjoys walking frequently along our coastal paths, particularly on the west coast of the island, I am dismayed at how rare it is that I actually get to see the sea when on my walks. It is no exaggeration to say that for the vast majority of my walks the views are restricted to overgrown brambles, weeds, nettles and bushes. The particular shame of this is manifest where benches are sighted along the path, either through personal contribution or local taxation only for the potential occupants to be offered a magnificent view of overgrown brambles and bushes. I'm left wondering whether our local councillors actually realise the hugely negative impression that their neglect of the hedgerows gives to both visitors and residents. Sim similar evidence of neglect can be found in the lack of attention to excessive roadside and footpath growth. Many of our narrow inland roads are now significantly more dangerous to transverse, having been reduced in navigable width whilst many footpaths risk being returned to nature entirely, even where once stood a substantial disused railway track, such as on the Red Squirrel Trail. Tourism is the island's lifeblood, and such penny-pinching neglect and or ill-conceived folly of eco-management will undoubtedly reduce its attractiveness to visitors. By the way of adding to this situation, the Isle of Wight Council's mooted intention to penalise second home and holiday homeowners through increased council tax charges will not help. There seems to be determination to devalue our attractiveness to those who currently visit and create both revenue and employment at just the time when we should be seizing the initiative to develop the Isle of Wight's appeal. 
Has this arisen through incompetence or has common sense just been replaced by common no nonsense? The local cycling and walking infrastructure plan sounds like a good idea unless, of course, once planned and implemented, it will simply provide more opportunity for disappointment and neglect. Why 50p to spend a penny from Julie White of Ride? I cannot believe that the toilets behind the Sundial Cafe in Sandown are 50p to use. Apparently, the council upped them from 20p to 50p in the summer holidays. They are disgusting inside. I would not let my little grandson go in. Do we not pay enough council tax every year? It increases and in return we don't get any increase in toilets or other services. More are closing. I'm sure our grandparents would turn in their graves to think we are paying to use a toilet. And that is the end of this week's Talking News. So it's goodbye from me, Susan. And it's goodbye from me, John. The BBC In Touch programme follows and the scaffolding news follows that. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Good evening. Last week, we concentrated on a relatively new method of training guide dogs called STEP, Standardised Training for Excellent Partnerships, that stands for. It puts the emphasis on reward and reinforcement rather than reprimand, and its advocates say that it's far more in line with today's societal attitudes towards animals and that it works. Others... Amongst them, some guide dog owners argue that in the practical world of using a dog to get around safely, it has some significant drawbacks. At the end of last week's programme, on the STEP method, I asked for your responses and in particular, your questions to be put directly to the guide dogs organisation. The response has been by far the largest that we've had to a programme this year. Over 30 well-considered questions and experiences. So thank you very much for all of those. There's no way we're going to fit them all in. But what we have tried to do is to pick questioners whose point represents the majority of your concerns. Not just on step, but on other major issues such as waiting lists for replacement dogs and eligibility. Joining us to field those questions is Pete Osborne. He is Chief Operations Officer at Guide Dogs. So let's dive straight in with your questions. Alan Dudley is from Edinburgh and uh, yours is very much Alan about the issue of controlling your dog that has been trained using the step method so uh, go ahead. I think I prefer to call it influencing because controlling sounds so authoritarian. I got my first dog in 1971 and trained with my last dog in 2018 and from a webinar that I heard from guide dogs they were saying they want guide dogs to control their own behaviour rather than have guide dog owners do it for them and I can see there's a lot of sense in that but what I am worried about is if somehow something goes wrong when you're working you've done your training and you're not quite sure what to do and the dog doesn't behave as expected or hoped not because it's a bad dog or anything but just because the circumstances are difficult a few years ago my dog Foster a big German Shepherd and I stumbled across a fire in some parkland had to retrace my steps and I had to keep both of us calm while we did that. And it worked ever so well, given the fact we both wanted to get the hell out of there. Pete Osborne, what do you say to that? I mean, Alan's point is you don't have to be being cross with the dog or anything, but you do have to be firm and very clear. And perhaps the implication is that anything that sounds even faintly like a reprimand is not approved of. <laughs> Yeah, so first and foremost, I would say it's absolutely crucial that as guide dog owners, we keep ourselves safe. And there will be situations where you need to do that. And we completely accept that. As a guide dog owner myself, I've done that fairly regularly. And that's inevitable. What I would say is a, a bit of a misconception that you can never say no to your dog. And that isn't the case. Even with the, the step methodology, you, you absolutely can. And there need to be situations where you will react firmly. There's a considerable difference, if you like, between how we teach our dogs to get things right first time and how we have to react to situations in the here and now and it's most important when the situation is with you and you need to react that you do so in a way that keeps you and your dog safe 
Alan, to what extent does that satisfy you, given that you've had a lot of dogs over a lot of years? I'm reassured up to a point, I think. But I also worry about the aspect of whether in giving rewards to dogs when they're taking you to curbs and things, you spoil the idea that dogs and guide dog owners work together because they like being with one another and that their relationship means that it, things go well. And indeed, I agree. But let's be clear, we've all rewarded our dogs for many, many years. You know, praise, good boy, well done, you know, is a reward to our dogs. It doesn't necessarily need to be a food reward. Many of our dogs will and certainly do continue to respond very nicely to praise. So I agree. As roots become familiar and as you expand the work that you're doing with your dog, then it's quite likely that the nature of reward will change. And that bond between your dog, sometimes the good boy, well done reward is just enough for your dog to actually recognise that the right thing has happened. Alan, thanks very much for putting our first question. Our next caller is not a guide dog owner, but she is a professional dog behaviourist and trainer who agrees wholeheartedly with the STEP method in principle, but she does have reservations about how it seems to be being applied to guide dogs. Charlotte Kasner, what is your main point and to what question does it lead? I've had four incidents with my previous dog two of them potentially fatal, where guide dogs had lunged and barked at my dog from a distance. And on one occasion, a guide dog owner could have been pulled onto a tube line and on the other across a major road. And I was very worried about the training. Now that I understand that they used a mix of positive punishment and positive reward, I understand why that happened. What concerns me now in the changeover to STEP and with guide dogs only having, I believe, five weeks training is that that may continue, particularly if there's not a wholehearted commitment to doing positive reinforcement and an understanding of it. Let me go to Pete. First of all, is it five weeks training? No, the training is substantially longer than that. And indeed, no, not for the, the dogs, I mean for the guide dog owners. For the guide dog owner, yeah. I mean, the, for the guide dog partnership, it's at least five weeks training, but also there's ongoing support for right. people. And we have a programme throughout the first year in particular where we will continue to visit people and support people throughout. I would agree with you. Actually, dog distraction, in a sense, is one of the biggest challenges that guide dog owners face. One of the things that we are looking at through the Puppy Raising for Excellent Partnerships programme is how we set our dogs up for success success and i absolutely agree with you it's imperative that we get the balance of that right so that actually when people experience the guide dog partnership they really should not be experiencing high levels of dog distraction because throughout the training program we have addressed that particular issue we have actually had some volunteers saying that maybe not enough support is still being given to the puppy raisers and i think the implication if I've understood some of these emails correctly is that the training in a sort of firm sense isn't really happening right from the beginning. What I'm very relieved about is that we've increased the number of specialists who are actually working with our puppy raisers. We have professionals who are able to get in and support our puppy raisers. So Charlotte, are you therefore to some extent reassured? Uh, I am very much so and I'm very interested to see how this actually plays out. As it happens, I have an acquaintance locally who's just got a new guide dog and she (laughs) strips off me about the STEP programme, not realising that's the way that I train. So I can hopefully watch this in action because she is certainly struggling with distractions. But I think it's a, a major step forward for canine welfare. Now, we did invite people to raise other issues. Guide dog owners won't be surprised to know that waiting lists, particularly for those who need a dog replacing due to retirement or health reasons, was very high on the list. And we've already heard it referred to. Derek Howie is waiting for his seventh dog never having had to wait in the past for more than two months, he says, to replace any of the previous six. But he's now worried and depressed. He emailed... Life without a guide dog ain't easy. For me, working with a white cane is head forward, slow and stop. So much so that I too frequently just can't be bothered even making the effort, especially coping with the hassles of clattering into and falling over pavement, obstacles, etc., Am I going to be kept hanging on for what seems like forever and a day for dog number seven? Do I need to consider moving to a remote Scottish island where I will no longer need a dog? And by the way, that's a serious question and an option which I am considering. 
That's how bad it's got for me. The implications of doglessness are potentially huge. Social isolation, weight gain and deterioration in physical and mental health are just some of the negative aspects caused by being stuck inside on your own for long periods. We thought we needed that picture of what it's like for people who are waiting for a dog who've been used to having one. And I suspect Derek uh, speaks for quite a lot of people. Pete Osborne, we've talked about waiting this before on this programme, often people waiting for years. What would you say to Derek and people like him? Two issues. First of all, I'd like to recognise those people that have recently lost a dog. It's very difficult. It's the most traumatic experience imaginable. What I would say about the waiting list is we are doing everything possible to recover the situation, and I'm afraid it takes time. I apologise to people who are having to wait for a long time. It's a consequence of the pandemic, but also the number of technical staff that we've got to deliver the partnerships that we need to deliver. And we're trying to recover on both fronts. We're now breeding uh, more than 130 dogs per month. And we're back up to levels of dogs in training that we saw prior to the pandemic and levels of success that we also saw prior to the pandemic. Well, you see, I think people bristle a bit when you talk about the pandemic because so many other organisations quote the pandemic as the reason for all sorts of things. And Derek says that things like retirement among trainers, which was given last week as one of the reasons for the problems, and the transition period while trainers get used to new methods, he says they should have been anticipated and factored in. And he's right, isn't he? Arguably, we could have done more to achieve that. But one of the things we really have struggled with is bringing on the required number of technical staff to get us to the levels that we need to be at. We now have a wonderful academy, which is a completely different approach. We have more than 70 staff in training, a present as guide dog trainers or mobility specialists, and we're bringing those staff through. But it does take time for us to recover to a level that we need to be at in order to reach as many people as are waiting for a guide dog. But, I mean, the numbers have been going down of successful partners partnerships and were going down before the pandemic began. The numbers that we are seeing of those people waiting for a guide dog, it's absolutely not where we want to be. And I will personally not rest until we're in a much better place than we are at the moment. We'll do everything possible to bring ourselves back on track. Right. I want to bring in Paul Nichols, who has a couple of suggestions about things you could do to speed up the whole business of waiting lists and time waiting. Paul, the okay. floor is yours. Right. Well, my first point is I wonder why it takes so long for reapplication process for replacement dogs. It's unnecessarily complicated. My last dog was withdrawn on the 14th of June by mutual agreement, I must say. My reapplication still hasn't been done. Guide dogs insist on sending out two members of staff to do three routes with me to prove that I know three routes in an area that I've lived in for over 40 years where all my dogs have lived, they just used to fill in a form. We didn't have to prove that we knew three routes. And you would argue that you are familiar to the Guide Dogs organisation because you've had other dogs. Well, I've had numerous aftercare visits. It's a complete waste of staff time. I can understand why it's done with new applicants. Let's get an answer to that. Okay. Um, why does it there have to be this long process? And other people have mentioned it. Kevin Lloyd is another uh, guide dog owner who mentioned this very thing. What's the answer to that, Pete? There are actually four elements to the process at the moment. First and second conversation, plus mobility assessment and guide dog assessment. And that, that is something we're looking to address going forward, specifically for reapplicants, although we've not reached a conclusion on that right now. What I would say is mobility assessment and guide dog assessment has actually been part of the process for a considerable length of time. And uh, congratulations on keeping your root knowledge up to date. That is not the case for all guide dog owners. And what we are seeing at the moment, actually, is a reduction in the successful qualifications from people on class due in part to people not necessarily having the knowledge that they need of the routes that they're doing, some of which has actually changed as a result of the environmental changes, possibly as part of the pandemic, but for other reasons. But if it becomes obvious that somebody like Paul is experienced and knows what he's doing and is well known to the organisation, can't there be some more flexibility? I agree we need to to make more rapid progress with that and I promise that's something we'll take away and look at. All right, second point, Paul. Isn't there a case to be made for actually closing, temporarily closing, the list for new applicants until the dog supply has reached a point where 
we have to wait weeks and months rather than months and years. Whilst there is a case for doing that, we've decided not to do that at this account. Have you considered it? Yes, we have considered that. And we have decided not to do that at this stage because we think it's really important for us to be able to reach out to people and support people in different ways. So our vision rehabilitation specialists, and we've been rapidly recruiting those people over recent years as well, were able to go out and support people. So give people the base level skills that they might need to then progress to guide dog ownership subsequently if that's what's needed. OK, I'm going to move on. I'm sure you've got more you'd love to ask, Paul. I want to end, though, with a couple of questions about eligibility who gets priority when it comes to their place on a waiting list Kowal Gukakoglu you got in touch with us about this what was the point you wanted to make I'm on dog number five and I waited four years for her I'm severely sight impaired and what I'd like to know why we are having to wait so long for a dog is it because a the dogs are not confident or good enough to take a visually impaired person who has no sight because that's what I've been told by the trainers or B is it something wrong with the breeding program so you're saying you think at the moment that totally or almost totally blind people are having to wait longer can I also yes. say Sandy Bannister is another example of, of someone who asked a very similar question about eligibility and also asked whether there was any statistical information about, you know, the numbers of totally blind people getting dogs. Yeah, I'm very sorry people are gaining that impression because it's not something that we can evidence. And indeed, the way in which we're training our dogs very much includes all of the requirements that anybody might need, including somebody with limited or no vision. In fact, a lot of the training actually takes place, particularly the later stages of training in blindfolds or mindfolds, so that we can actually get this absolutely right. Though I'm conscious that it is a perception. You are there. hearing this, I take it yeah. from what you say. Yeah, but- we do hear this on occasions. I can find no evidence to support it. You know, we will continue to be very aware of it and indeed the matching process that takes place is very much on on the basis that it's more complex than someone's vision it's someone's family situation their work situation the speed of which they walk you know etc etc so their vision or someone's vision is a small part of the equation and certainly not the whole part really the thing we're trying to assess is whether a guide dog will be of significant benefit to the individual in enabling their independence okay another point on eligibility Irene Randall asked us why the guide dog waiting list wasn't held nationally rather than locally so that um, people who'd been on the waiting list longest and who were prepared to travel to get a dog would get fairer treatment. In certain circumstances where people have been waiting a very long time, we will take a national position. But you can only imagine the complexities, the logistics of potentially moving dogs around the country, depending on where the match takes place, and making sure that we've got available staff that understand how to progress that partnership. But if, but if that, people, that would be quite I, difficult to do. I think her point was, though, if people are prepared to travel, to go to the, the area where there is a dog available for training, you know, if the waiting list is based on the region, then they wouldn't get that opportunity, would they? That may be true in some cases. Around 70% of the training that we do at the moment starts residentially. So what we wouldn't want to do is disadvantage those people either. Where necessary, we will move dogs around the country in order to get the best possible match because ultimately it's the success of that match and the success of the partnership in subsequent years that is actually what we're all about. We want to make sure these partnerships stay together and that they support people like us throughout their whole life. One final question. We've had all the questions that we're having from listeners, but is there a timescale for getting this fixed, particularly waiting lists, and raising the potential of successful partnerships? Because that is still lower than you would like, isn't it? Somewhere around 60% when it was 80%. Yeah, we've typically seen in-training success at around 70%. We're working back towards that. That's a gradual improvement. This is going to take time. A huge challenge we have is in volunteering, particularly for fosterers. But I promise we'll be doing everything possible, including recruiting and training more technical staff to get us back to the situation that we all want to be in. Do you have a target date? No, I'm not going to give you a target date because it's a gradual approach and it takes some time for us to get there. Pete Osborne, thank you very much for coming on and answering all those questions. People may still have their doubts about one thing and another, but we've done our best to cover as much ground as we can. And thank you all of those who took the trouble to contact us about it. 
That's all for today. If you want to respond to anything you've just heard or indeed anything else you'd like us to tackle on the programme, you can email in touch at bbc.co.uk or leave your voice message on 0161 836 1338. Meanwhile, from me, Peter White, producer Beth Hemmings and studio managers Sue Stone Street and Liam Juniper, goodbye. Here is this week's scaffolding news. Scaffolding and Skips News week commencing 18th September 2023. Newport area, 62 Castle Hold Lane, 27 Pyle Street, 32 Chapel Street, 1A High Street, 27 Lugley Street, JD Sports, 110 to 112 High Street, Key House, Key Street, Clinton Cards, 42 High Street, McDonald's, 93 to 94 Upper St James Street, Skips, Newport area, 6 Dodner Mews, Dodner Lane. The Ride area, Hills Court, Newport Street, Flat One, St Leonard's, Pier View, sorry. Flat One, St Leonard's, Pier Road, Sea View, 107, <coughs> St John's Road, 17, St John's Road Ride, 49, George Street, 66, Union Street, and 20, Green Street. And the Cows area, 71, York Street, 6, Terminus Road, 42 to 48, St Mary's Road. And Ventnor area, the Met Bar, Ventnor Esplanade. <laughs>